Well, good morning, church. It's good to be here with you, uh, and I trust that uh, 2020 has uh, underway for you in a, in a good way. Um, we, uh, uh, Diane and I, uh, traveled uh, to see some family members uh, in, uh, in, in January. We saw our son and our daughter in Florida, and then uh, we participated in uh, Mission 2020, and uh, there were uh, uh, quite a few people together uh, for a big mission festival of the Reformed Church in America. And then we moved to Hungary, and uh, that's where Diane is uh, right now, getting set up, uh, setting up our office and our home base there in Hungary. And, uh, and I'm here uh, for a couple of weeks, two weeks, uh, to help out, and then I'll be back again in March for two weeks, and then I'll be here the entire month of April, and then so on and so forth until Pastor Blaine comes. Are we praising God that Pastor Blaine is coming? Can we give the Lord a hand for that? Yeah, amen. <laughs> And so uh, it's just a pleasure to be here and to uh, be working with Pastor Keith and helping out a little bit. Uh, and uh, as, as we're doing that, uh, uh, we're going to do a study. I'm going to conduct a, a little study. It'll be kind of cut up over the time that I'm here of the six chapters of Galatians. And uh, we're, we're going to talk about our hearts being set free by the truth, by the power of the gospel. Wherever I go, when I see people who are set on fire by the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is love, there is balance, there is joy, there is the growth of the church. And wherever I see people concentrating on something else, uh, there is uh, uh, decline, there is uh, destruction, there is confusion. And uh, people, we need to pray for the American church. We need to pray for the European church. Uh, these are people set in confusion uh, in so many ways, the churches. Uh, and yet there are these uh, glimpses of gospel renewal and revival, uh, even among uh, those, those older churches uh, in the north. And so pray for us, pray for those uh, who are in those places. Um, one of the things I noticed uh, is uh, uh, I really miss worship in Bahrain. There's just no dancing at all uh, in North America. People just, you know, I guess the cold makes you not able to dance, right, or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's so good to be here and to, and, to, and to be with you and to share the word with you. And so let's dive into chapter 1. Uh, thank you, Richard, for reading it, and uh, as we study it, let's pray uh, for God's blessing on the Word. Lord, we pray that you would open your Word to us today, that you would help us to understand the good news of Jesus Christ, the Gospel, in more depth. Lord, that you would fill us with your Spirit, so that we would not just understand, but that our hearts would be set free, that we would burn with love and passion for your truth, and that we would be transformed by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want us to talk about three topics. Uh, the, the subject of chapter one really is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I want us to talk about the essence of the gospel, what it really is, the exclusivity of the gospel, basically what the boundaries, what the, what the content of the gospel is, and the authority of the gospel, how we know we can believe in the gospel of Jesus. And so as we look at these subjects, I want us to start with the essence of the gospel. And, and in the first five verses, I'm just going to repeat them, uh, we see the essence of the gospel of Jesus. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but from Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, 
according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. In these verses, Paul the Apostle gives us three things that are the very essence of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And, and the first of those things is the cross. The cross is at the very center of the gospel. It is the very foundation of the gospel. Jesus gave himself for us, Paul says. Jesus gave himself for us on the cross as a substitute. He substituted himself and paid the penalty for our sin. And Jesus took that penalty that we owed to God upon himself on our behalf. He took it upon himself and he paid that penalty for us. He paid all that we should have paid. And he paid more than we could ever have paid in order to erase our debt and free us from sin and condemnation forever. The cross is the central message of the gospel. In fact, in later in other parts of Paul, he says he, he equates preaching the gospel with preaching the cross. And so as we lift up the cross, as we preach the cross, as we look to the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us, it is the essence of the gospel. There is no gospel without the cross. There is no Christianity without Jesus being our substitute. Now, the second thing that Paul shows us is our need for the cross, our need for the gospel. We need to be rescued, he says, from this present evil age. We need to be rescued. And if we're going to understand the gospel, we cannot understand it as some sort of religious philosophy or some sort of uh, moral teaching. People really want to make Jesus primarily into a teacher, into a guru, into uh, someone who leads us into teaching that will help us to live a better life. But that is not what Paul is saying. He says our basic need is not instruction. Our basic need is rescue. We need to be rescued. Several years ago, I was at the Four Points Sheridan Hotel in Chicago. And it is, a, it is a hotel that is really near O'Hare Airport, right? Um, and uh, and uh, this is a, it, it's, it's an older hotel, so it had a pool. It had a swimming pool uh, with a hot tub uh, and then a, a pool that had a shallow end and a deep end. Now they don't have pools that have deep ends because they don't want people to be uh, drowned, right? And... Uh, and so, uh, so I was sitting in this hot tub next to the pool, just relaxing after a day of meetings, and I met a, a couple. They were taking the trip of a lifetime. They were going to take all of their kids, all of their grandkids, and they were going uh, on a plane uh, to the Caribbean, and they were going to have this trip of a lifetime. And we talked, and we just visited for a while. It was really delightful. And then he went, and he got in the pool, and his wife got in the pool as well. And I, of course, uh, you know, not being a person that enjoys exercise at all, stayed in the hot tub, right? <laughs> and uh, and I, I was in the hot tub, and I was relaxing, and all of a sudden I heard, Sir, sir! And I looked, and it was the man's wife, and he says, My husband is in the deep end, and he doesn't know how to swim. And so I immediately got out of the pool and I dove into the deep end and I swam to him and I pulled him to the shallow end and I got him to safety and to rescue and they, uh, you know, the story is happily ever after they went on the trip and, and, and they were very, very grateful that I was there because I could swim. It was the only time I've ever saved anybody in my life. <laughs> if it were you, I would do the same thing. Yeah. 
But you know, the thing that occurred to me, first of all, when I heard my husband is in the pool and he can't swim, he's in the deep end of the pool and he was underneath the water, he's, he's sunk like a stone. My first inclination was not to say, well, why can't he swim? <laughs> hey, here is a manual of instructions on how to swim. Everybody should learn to swim. Now, what if I had said that to her? What if I had thrown him a manual and said, hey, read up on this, and then you'll be able to swim? It would have been useless. It would have been tragic. Nothing would have happened. What we need as a people living in this present evil age is not more information. It's not more instruction. It's not more wisdom in how we should live. We know intuitively in many ways how we should live. What we need is rescue. We need somebody to dive in the pool and get us and fish us out and rescue us from death. Rescue us from this present evil age. And this is the essence of the gospel. We need a savior. We don't need a reformer. We don't need a great teacher. But we need someone who would come for us, dive into the pool with us, and rescue us and fish us out of the danger that we're in, that our souls are in. And we have to understand the need that we are in if we are to understand the gospel that we believe and preach. Does that make sense? And then finally, in the essence of the gospel, is that it brings glory to God. At the very center of the gospel is the glory of God. He is the glorious and supreme being. He is the glorious creator of everything. But his glory really, really, really shines when we give him glory as our rescuing Savior, as our beautiful Savior. The glory of the gospel points to the true glory of God. Not that God is great. He is great. We're not disputing with our, with, with our fellow citizens. We're not disputing that God is great. But his glory is not that he is great. His glory is that God is love. That God loves us. That he came for us. That he sent his son to dive in for us and to rescue us by going to death on a cross. That is the essence of what we believe. That is the message of the gospel. That is what saves us. That is our glory as Christians. Now this gospel is exclusive. And so that's the second point. It is the exclusivity of the gospel. And let me explain that. It's hard for people to hear these words, exclusive, in the 21st century, because we're about being inclusive, right? And, and we should be. But let me explain it. Let's look at the verses, verses 6 through 10. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now it seems that the Galatians were being 
taught by certain people that you needed to do some other things other than believe the gospel in order to become a Christian. In this case, uh, the Judaizer party was coming and saying, you know, the first thing you have to do to really be a Christian is to become a Jew. You have to be circumcised. And these people were Gentiles. They were not circumcised. Their male babies were not circumcised. And so you need to be circumcised. You need to convert to Judaism. And then you can accept the gospel. Because all of the original apostles were Jews. And so, therefore, that's what you need to do. And Paul is saying that he is astonished that among the Galatians there are people that were believing this that we're believing that you had to add something to the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, Paul wanted to show that all of truth comes from God alone. All truth is God's truth. The gospel is the most inclusive message of all time. It is the most inclusive message of all time. It is for everyone, everywhere. The purpose of the church, the purpose of the church is not uh, to, to, to uh, do some of the things, you know, just to make Christians feel better about being Christians. It is to spread the gospel to everyone, everywhere. So we want to include everyone in this message. It is a universal truth with a universal claim on all people everywhere. It's not just true for the people who believe it. It is true for everyone at all times. Everything that is true agrees with God because God is the author of all things that are true. If something is true in any religion or philosophy, it is because it aligns with God's nature and character. And so when Paul says, I didn't get this from a, a human being, I got it directly from God. He's saying that this is true truth. Now, I'm not saying that all religions are true. But if anything that is, is true in a religion, any part of that religion is true, it is because the God of the Bible is the source of that particular truth. So when we say that the gospel is truth, we are saying that it is true for everyone, everywhere, for all time. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is why there can be no alternative gospel. This brings us to the exclusivity of the gospel. There can be no alternative gospel. Gospel revision equals gospel reversal, Paul says. If you start to change the gospel, you are actually making it no gospel at all. You can't subtract from the gospel or add to it without perverting it. Another gospel is not another gospel. According to Galatians, it is no gospel at all. It's sort of like a vacuum, right? A vacuum is where there is no air. All the air has been taken out of the vacuum. Now, if you put a little bit of air into a vacuum-sealed container, is it a vacuum? It is absolutely not. But what if we just put a little bit? What if we just change it a little bit? What if we just, you know, put a few molecules of air into that, into that vacuum? It is not a vacuum, unless it is a vacuum. It is not the gospel, unless it is the gospel. It's not centered on the cross and our need and God's glory unless it is centered on those things. Now, there are three main ways, I think, that people try to change the gospel. And, and one of those is, is mentioned here. But there are three main ways that people try to alter the gospel. They say, yes, we want Jesus Christ. We want to love him. We want his cross. We want all those things. But we have to add our own works to that. We have to add a few things to it, right? So they, they, they start to put all kinds of, uh, of, of, of qualifiers on it. They may say you need to surrender to Christ in a certain way, with a certain level of fervor. 
with a certain amount of emotion. They may say that you need certain gifts that God imparts to you uh, when you when you really accepted the gospel, right? They may say that you have to do, you know, you have to show certain amounts of fruit or we can't really tell if you're a Christian. Now, I want to say to you, Jesus died between two thieves. And there was a thief that was promised that he would be in paradise that very day with Jesus. And he bore no fruit in his life. He believed in the gospel, and he died without doing anything, and he went straight to be with Jesus that day. You see, the fruit of the gospel is important, don't get me wrong, but it comes after, it comes with time, it comes over time. You are saved the moment you believe on Jesus Christ. All who call upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10 says, are saved. It's done. It's finished. At that moment. And adding anything to it, adding if anyone wants to add a qualifier to it, they are preaching no gospel at all. It is not the message of Christianity. The second thing that people want to do is they want to subtract faith from the equation. They want to say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe or that you believe as long as you're a good person. Right? Have you heard this one? Well, they're a good person. Right? As long as you're a good person, it's just fine. You're safe. But that is a perversion of the gospel because No one can be saved except by the power of the cross. No one can be saved unless Jesus comes into their life in his death and his resurrection and transforms them and makes them born again by the power of the Spirit. No one is saved unless they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And so, you know, actually, this is, this is a, 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 a sort of a tricky thing because people want to say, well, you know, I just believe that everyone is fine. Which actually puts everyone in the position of having to do good works to get salvation, which no one can do because everyone is drowning. If everyone is drowning, they don't need instructions. They don't need further teaching They need a rescue from Jesus. And then the third way, and this is a little bit more obvious, and it's what the the, the Judaizers were doing, and we see it all the time, is people add legalism to the faith. What you eat, what you drink, how you dress, who you date, what ceremonies you perform, right? I don't, you know dance, spit or chew, or go around with girls who do, right? I thought that was funnier than you did, right? Nobody, uh, it's an Americanism, let's see, yeah, sorry about that. But uh, you know, you know this type of person. You wear a certain clothing. You abstain from certain kinds of food. You do certain kinds of things in addition to believing in the gospel, and you'll be saved. And this is what the Judaizers were doing. This is what was saying. And, and Paul was saying, oh, you know, that's really a, 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 an error. You, you should, you know, maybe have a committee meeting and do something about that, right? Get rid of that food law, that circumcision law. He says, no, I am astonished that you are abandoning the gospel. See, you start adding anything to it. There is nothing left in it. There's no power in the cross if you try to add anything of yourself to it. That's why it's exclusive. It's exclusively true for you and for me that we stand needing rescue before our Savior. Paul goes on to say, how do I know this? What authority do I have to tell you all of this? 
What is the authority of the gospel? And verses 11 through 24, look at it with me. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, or was I taught it? Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the tradition of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. And I assure you before God that what I am writing is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy and they praised God because of me. Now Paul describes his testimony here. He said, I have witnessed the risen Christ. The gospel is established because the witnesses are authoritative. The gospel is established by the apostles and their witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The twelve that saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead, and Paul. And this is why he gives his testimony. Not to point out his greatness, but to point out that the truth of the gospel is received by God from the risen Savior himself. That's where Cephas got it. That's where James got it. That's where all of the apostles got it. They got it from seeing Jesus himself risen from the dead. And these witnesses are authentic. Paul was not having a dream. He was not having a vision on the road to Damascus. But he was seeing the risen Savior in person, just as the twelve and the five hundred at one time had seen him during the 40 days between Easter Sunday and Ascension Day. Right? He was seeing Jesus. Now, our faith is not based on human philosophy or theological speculation. It is based on eyewitness accounts of Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. It is based on the historical record of an observable event that happened in space and time. So this is not something that is a theory. It is something that occurred. It is something that happened. When Jesus' body began to breathe again, as we sang this morning, everything changed for humanity. The rules were changed. The gospel was authenticated and made true for everyone, everywhere, at all times. Paul is saying that he was included in this event on the road to Damascus and is included as an apostolic witness with a big A to the risen Jesus. And all of these witnesses, Cephas, James, all the other apostles that heard about Paul and said, the one who persecuted us is now with us, all agree. The other apostles accepted this in Jerusalem and rejoiced because of it. Paul is establishing that the gospel he preached to the Galatians is in its essence and exclusive claims the truth established by the agreement of many witnesses. See, when witnesses disagree in court, their testimony is invalid. And the apostles' witnesses' witness is in harmony. All of the 12, all of the 500 that saw Jesus alive agree. It's interesting that these 12 men never wavered in their witness to the resurrection of Jesus. I don't know if you've heard of Chuck Colson. 
Uh, he passed away a little while ago, but um, uh, he was a, a center figure in one of the series of ongoing scandals that apparently is United States politics. Yeah. And uh, he was involved in the Watergate break in and cover up that that brought down President Nixon. And uh, and he says this. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that, endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The witnesses all agree. Jesus is risen. He arose following the most daring and sacrificial rescue mission ever planned and executed. The gospel is true. The gospel is clear. The gospel is simple. The gospel is for you today and for me today. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will we receive it? Will you live your life by it? Will you join with me in celebrating it? Will you go with me in spreading it to everyone, everywhere? Because the gospel is life. The gospel is truth. And the gospel sets our hearts free. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you for the authority of the gospel here among us in this church. We thank you for our desire to include everyone in its exclusive plan. And Lord, we pray that we would make our message its essential truth. That your cross saves us that you, Jesus, rescued us, that is your glory to love us. And so, Father, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would transform our lives by the power of the gospel and that you would help us to spread this message to everyone, everywhere. Oh, Lord, we offer this to you. We offer our lives to you. In Jesus' name.